In this video presentation, I will be showing two editors, one classical and one contemporary. These being Nino Barali and Tom Cross. Two completely different types of editors with completely different techniques. But let's first have a history lesson on who these guys are. So let's start with Nino Barali, my classical editor. Nino Barali was an Italian film editor with more than 200 film credits. These range with films such as Crazy Westerners, Galileo, He and She, and many, many more. But Barali is most well known for The Good, The Bad and The Ugly and Once Upon a Time in the West, both directed by Sergio Leone. I think this is what makes them easiest to compare and easiest to analyse as they're both English spoken films. As Nino Barali is Italian, so a lot of his films are in Italian. Now before I start with Nino Barali, my second editor, who is my contemporary editor, is Tom Cross. Tom Cross is an American television and film editor. He began his career in 1997 as an assistant director, contributing to such diverse projects as We Own the Night, Crazy Heart, and prime time Emmy Award winning drama TV series, Deadwood. He came to worldwide prominence in 2015 when he won the Independent Spirit Award for Best Editing a BAFTA Award for Best Editing and an Academy Award for Best Editing, among other honours for his work on the acclaimed film Whiplash. He cited that The Wild Bunch and The French Connection are influences on the editing on this film and reunited with writer-director Damien Chazelle on the musical romantic comedy La La Land. It's Whiplash I mainly want to focus on for Tom Cross's editing, as it's one of my personal favourite films, and I think it has plenty of editing techniques that I will talk about. Right, so now you know who my key editors are, I'm now going to talk about Nino Barali's editing within Sergio Leone's film The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. This edit is called the Mathematical Edit. You might ask why? Well, within the scene of the film, also known as the trio scene, this puts all three characters in a Mexican standoff over some gold in a Civil War burial ground. Now, this scene is known for being the longest standoff in Western cinema, as it goes on for two and a half minutes without any action actually happening, but with a fast-paced instrumental playing over to draw suspense, which draws me to the scene as how Leone turns a slow standoff into one of the most suspenseful pieces of art by the power of editing which also dives into a deeper meaning. Let's start with how this scene is done. And it starts with a long shot of our characters and then ends with a long shot of our characters. Angel Eyes being the one who bites the bullet and Tuco panicking with an empty gun. But it's about what's filled with the starting shot and the end shot. This style of editing positions the shots in sequence that will actually reveal how the characters are feeling and how Blondie holds the control and how Angel Eyes will lose this standoff, revealing him the most, which makes him the most on edge. The edit usually links pieces, and whenever there is a close-up, it will follow the character in the direction they are looking. So if Angel Eyes were to look at Tuco, it would then cut to Tuco. But the thing that interests me is the connection between Blondie and Tuco. As for a moment, it keeps going back and forth between the two, setting up Blondie's motive of teaming with Tuco. This is because Blondie already knows how this fight will end. He is personally unloaded Tuco's gun, so he doesn't have to worry about Tuco. I feel like this sets up their little connection and makes them sort of team up against Angel Eyes. Now, the reason it has its name is because if you were to place these shots next to each other, you'd see that there is a pattern. This scene ends up having a total of 65 shots, and each one of them serves a purpose. The scene features three characters, so each shot will be with one of them. So how many permutations of the three characters are there? Ultimately, there are 25 shots in this scene, which can be arranged in different orders. Over the next 25 shots, Leone uses editing to foreshadow and gives us an insight of what the characters are thinking. Each character receives their own amount of shots, 
Blondie takes seven out of 25 shots in the scene. We know that he knows how this will end and he doesn't have to worry about Tuco because he has personally unloaded his gun. However, Blondie also has to make sure Angel Eyes doesn't shoot Tuco as Tuco doesn't even know his gun is empty. He is lost and cannot find a strategy to this fight. His eyes shift fast back and forth. He also gets seven out of 25 shots as if setting him up equal to with Blondie. And as we know, Angel Eyes is facing Christ, the odds aren't in his favour, and he gets a total of 11 out of 25 shots as he tries to figure out who to shoot first. He gets more shots than the others as his conflict is more significant. He realises that the standoff choice to draw is his to make as the odds are not in his favour which make it his fight to lose. This is why we see more shots of him reaching for his gun than anyone else. Along with the music this scene gets incredibly faster which comes to an end with the final long shot. I personally recreated this scene but as it's too long to show here, here's a brief clip of my gunless, unenthusiastic friends. I want to show this final duel scene as a way to show continuity editing. In this scene, we see two characters, Harmonica, who is the hero in this story, seeking revenge on our other character, Frank who is a cold-hearted outlaw who killed his older brother in the past. This film is obviously Once Upon a Time in the West. In this scene we get another long standoff with triumphant music playing as Frank moves into place. It's after they stop getting into position we are finally revealed why Harmonica wants revenge on Frank and it zooms to a close-up his, of his face. And this scene offers us a whole character arc with a silent scene which indicates what's going on in Harmonica's mind. The shot then cuts to a younger Frank who is walking towards the shot. He again does another pull into Harmonica's eyes which sets up where our characters were positioned in the past. This gets edited into a match cut of his eyes and the Harmonica being placed into his mouth. The whole crane pull suddenly shows all the ways Frank has victimized Harmonica in the past. This scene is scripted with no speaking and forces us to understand the scene through its music. The pacing of the editing also quickens with the music. Leone chooses to have the speaking in this shot as he only wants to show the scene in pure cinematic joy. And then as younger harmonica falls, the camera cuts back to the shootout. And in a brief quick shot, the duel is over with Frank being shot. The scene also ends with Frank on the ground matching the previous shot with harmonica on the ground, showing who is now in power of the two. Right, now I've explored two techniques with Barali, I'm now going to explore Tom Cross's techniques, but this time only with one film, Whiplash. Whiplash always comes to interest when editing, as Tom Cross has won awards for his work in editing for the film. But I'm interested in two techniques for this film, which are quick cuts and power edits. We'll start with the quick cuts. I want to show this one scene in particular. Success story. So Got Andrew, it. our or protagonist, is late to Fletcher's upcoming part. show, That's and he has forgotten his drumsticks. So Andrew has to rush to get them as the scene plays out. So I like this technique because it cuts from leaving the building and rushing to his car in this style of fast cutting. This style can be seen in mainly Edgar Wright films, but I like this quick little section including as I don't think it's overdone throughout the film. The technique is simple, several shots cut very fast together. I happen to recreate this scene as well. Now the quips technique is done, my last technique is the power edit, which is essentially Fletcher's entire character in this film. Do you think you're out of tune? Yes. Then why the fuck didn't you say so? This dynamic that he has on the film is everything. Let's take a look at this first scene. We get a long pull into Andrew playing Caravan on the drums. This being the song he will play at the end. It seems we are a point of view of Fletcher, as Andrew stops it cuts to Fletcher. Every word that comes out of Fletcher's mouth, he will be on the screen when he speaks. Fletcher also controls the music throughout the film, 
showing his power. Another thing this scene features is the camera's level on each character, as Fletcher's will be a low shot, making him appear bigger than Andrew and forcing Andrew to always look up, giving the impression he is below Fletcher. Fletcher takes control of this scene and later the whole film. This is his film. Let's look at this other scene. Andrew's first lesson seems a stressful one. As everyone is getting ready, he waits patiently until Fletcher arrives. The room feels silent suddenly, instantly becoming Fletcher's scene. Fletcher obviously becomes picky on Andrew's ability. So when Fletcher orders Andrew to stop, he will stop. Andrew is always the weaker one in this scene, and Fletcher is always in power. But I thank you for watching. Some of these techniques are definitely harder than the others, but I hope you now have some understanding on this subject.